Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Deanne Herman, Chief Administrative Officer of APEX, the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies. Welcome to our panel discussion, Blockchain and Cryptocurrency, How Regulatory Policy Can Impact Innovation and Opportunities for Financial Inclusion. We are delighted to partner with Blockchain Association, a leading organization in the US blockchain and cryptocurrency industry, and thrilled to have them as the event sponsor as we jump into this discussion. We are excited to provide members of the AAPI community and beyond important information in a continually technologically advancing world. We are excited to hear the insight and expertise of Blockchain Association's member organizations and honored to have joined with Kristen Smith, founding executive director of the Blockchain Association. Kristen is a widely recognized and respected leader on crypto and financial innovation policy, having been included on Fortune's 2020 30 under 40 list, the Hill's 2020 top lobbyist list, and a 22 ranking on Cointelegraph's top 100 notable people in blockchain in 2021. She's a frequent commentator in print and television with recent appearances that include CNBC, Yahoo Finance, Fox Nation, and Cheddar. Kristen has an MBA in finance from NYU Stern and a graduate degree from Georgetown University. Please welcome our moderator for today's discussion, Kristen Smith. Uh, thank you, Deanne. Uh, good morning. I'm thrilled to moderate today's briefing. Uh, the Blockchain Association is commemorating three years this month, and it is an honor to partner with APAX to help educate its network and stakeholders about blockchain and cryptocurrency. Not an easy subject for sure. Um, but thank you for your leadership, Deanne. Um, we appreciate the important work that you and your team are leading. Uh, to our virtual audience, welcome. Uh, we want you to participate in the conversation. So please use the hashtag, uh, hashtag APAICS blockchain on social media. Um, and you can use the um, Q&A option in Zoom uh, if you wanna chime in with thoughts or questions. Uh, and we will get to those later on in the program. Uh, so we have a wonderful schedule ahead of us today. Uh, we will kick off with a panel discussion, uh, followed by a fireside chat with Congressman Ro Khanna, uh, who is uh, from, uh, from California. Uh, but first, uh, we're excited to have Congressman Raja Krish Krishnamurthy join us. He is a member of the Congressional Asian Pacific America Caucus and the Congressional Blockchain Caucus. Uh, the Congressman is committed to working with all members of Congress uh, to look for ways the federal government can help small business owners by making lending simple and transparent, repealing burdensome regulations, and modernizing the nation's tax policies, according to his website. Uh, he has earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Princeton University and understands the important role technology plays in growing our nation's economy. Welcome, Congressman. Hi everybody, I'm Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy from the 8th District of Illinois. Thank you so much to APEX and the Blockchain Associations for uh, inviting me to address you. I wanna specifically thank Madeline Milka and Kristen Smith for inviting me today. As a member of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus and the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, I understand the relationships between financial technology and underserved communities. I'm committed to fighting to increase opportunities for minority communities to enter both the technology and financial sectors. I've worked extensively to expand career and technical education programs that would supply more diverse communities a pathway towards careers in tech. And with this bipartisan infrastructure bill, I'm hoping we can do more. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw entrepreneurs and small businesses leverage blockchain technology to solve problems and innovate and we need to ensure they can build, scale, and thrive. We also saw cryptocurrency become increasingly mainstream in financial markets. Looking beyond the pandemic, we can tap emerging technologies like blockchain and cryptocurrency to grow the economy. And America uh, can become the engine for innovating in this space. 
talent and entrepreneurship are not determined by race, class, gender, or creed. I'm committed to creating deep partnerships, both within and outside industry and government to share knowledge, identify opportunities, and co-create a digital future that's more secure and equitable. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman Krishnamurthy. Uh, now on to our panel discussion. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the Blockchain Association, we are uh, the unified voice for the blockchain and cryptocurrency industry. And over the past three years, along with our 50 plus uh, member organizations, we've worked to educate policymakers, courts, uh, law enforcement, and the public about crypto networks um, and the um, need for regulatory clarity in order to make the way for a more secure, competitive, and innovative digital marketplace. Uh, I'm thrilled to be joined today by executives from three of our member companies, Filecoin Foundation, Binance US, and Rally. Um, and we will drop their bios in the chat so you can learn more about them. Uh, but first we have Ira Lam, who is the general counsel at Rally. Raj Mukherjee, uh, vice president and global head of tax at Binance US. And Clara Sow, who is the founding officer and director of the Filecoin Foundation. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, like to start by having each of you tell the audience about your organization and the work you are leading. And why don't we start with you, Ira? Great, thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you so much to Apex for making this event happen. It's so important to really focus in on the inclusion and the amazing innovations that blockchain is bringing to economic communities everywhere. Um, so I work with Rally. Um, we are a project focused on empowering content creators to build communities with their fans through use of blockchain and crypto. Um, and we are founded by a team of builders. We believe in the power of blockchain to as a technology essentially to bring financial inclusion to normal people um, because the technology enables something that we've never really had before, the true ability to have peer-to-peer -peer interactions. Um, we have some amazing folks and creators on our platform already. Um, Extina has a woman coin um, and she uses the coin to empower women to run businesses and projects. Um, we have great, great game streamers like Ali Straza. She brings communities together through her gameplay and through the really vibrant community of folks in gaming. Um, we have musicians and producers like Jaws, empowering musicians and other folks that are producing music to actually have a voice, especially during pandemic when so many things had shut down, really building these communities around musicians, um, artists like Jen Stark. There's, um, you know, she's actually working to bring other artists into the crypto community. So there's many opportunities and we really believe that crypto can enable all of this. So we're very proud to be part of this um, engagement right now. And we're really excited to see all the innovations that are still yet to come. Great, thank you, Ira. Uh, Clara, please tell us a little bit about the Filecoin Foundation uh, and the work that you are leading. Absolutely. So the Powerpoint Foundation has just celebrated its one year birthday. So it was not around um, over a year ago. We had our test net launch um, just uh, October of last year. Um, and we are so excited to see so much acceleration in our ecosystem. So some history on Filecoin. Many of you guys um, know other currencies, but um, we really, um, I don't actually say uh, I run a crypto uh, foundation, I say I run a technology company because that's what we do. We're trying to do decentralized file storage, um, leveraging the technology of the blockchain to do so. Um, and we truly believe that storing humanity's most important information is so critical because so many people all around the world, uh, they're dealing um, with dictatorship countries or are in situations where information access really leads to economic mobility. And um, a lot of them um, do not have this when, when governments decide to completely censor um, what, what can or can't be seen. And so we really allow for... Oh, uh, we, we really allow for reliable data storage and... Uh, we, we allow for reliable data storage, um, starting with, you know, peer peer network and we have storage providers all around the world that are upkeeping data. We also have a nonprofit arm, the Falcon Foundation for the Decentralized Web that Kristen is actually a board member of. And um, that arm is really focused on research development and accelerating uh, the Web3 ecosystem to make sure that we really have a really robust ecosystem of developers, um, of startups of companies that are really thinking about the next generation of the web 
um, and also how we can really allow for inclusion of everyone around the world. Uh, great, Raj, and tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you're doing at Finance US. Thanks, Kristen. It's, a, it's an honor to be part of this presentation. Um, I am the head of tax for Binance US, which is the a third largest uh, regulated crypto exchange um, in the United States. Uh, we are a separate legal entity from Binance.com, uh, which is the largest crypto exchange outside of the United States. Um, like many of the other exchanges, we have a range of products for our customers, such as trading and um, deposits and staking. Uh, my job really is to ensure uh, that from a tax compliance perspective, Binance US is um, keenly aware of all the regulatory requirements from product ideation to marketing. Um, in addition to that, I play um, a pretty central role in ensuring uh, dialogue and um, discussions with industry, um, industry colleagues as well as the government um, as we get to this next stage where regulation is imminent. Uh, we want to make sure that um, as this industry is growing, that the regulations are both friendly uh, to a, a young industry, but also uh, meets the standards um, of, of a regulatory framework that, that, um, th that is workable on both sides. Uh, Raj, why don't we keep going with you? I'd like to get into the discussion about financial inclusion and how crypto can foster economic empowerment. Um, do you have any thoughts on that that you'd like to share? Sure. I think, um, you know, I think one of the things I'd like to say ahead of time, and I think is that, you know, these opinions are actually mine. They don't reflect uh, Binance US's official position. Uh, with that said, um, I think one of the things that anyone that has been involved in digital currency understands um, and probably will agree to that traditional financial markets and the way we have done things for the last hundred years has often um, left inclusion behind. It has been very uh, specific to a, a either a small demographic or a small population. Uh, and it has left many, many around the world and even in the United States uh, without the opportunity to be part of that revolution. So when you look at something called Finance 2.0 or Finance 3.0, according to some people, I think the big part of that is how do we make through technology um, things that are uh, finance that is accessible to everybody, right? So for example, um, you know, if you, in a traditional world, you know, if you have to provide a certain amount of collateral or you have to go and fill in a ton of paperwork to, to make anything happen, why do that? Technology has made life so much interesting and so much more effective and easy in many other, in many other industries. So why not use that technology and with the power of an app or, you know, and from your smartphone, uh, you can be part of that. And the other other thing is, I think this is a world where you can have fractional ownership as part of a whole ecosystem. You don't need to have the capital and you don't need to have the, uh, you know, the wealth to, to own something in, as a whole, right? Because for average people, both in the United States and around the world, uh, not all of us are in the top 1%, so, but we also want to be part of this evolution. So I think the blockchain technology with its transparency, um, the the access and, and the ease with which you can participate makes it, you know, the, the next revolution, in my opinion. Clara, anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I wanted to go back to the impact of financial inclusion and information access. Um, today, if um, I wanted to delete photos from my phone because Apple is telling me I've maxed out on my iCloud storage, uh, they're going to ask me for $9.99 each month. And um, I really care about my photos. So I'm just going to keep paying. If they switch the price to $50, I'll keep paying, right? So today we have a lot of large monopolies that own a lot of um, a lot of data um, that is a fundamental of the web. And we are really believing that, you know, not one organization should own this, but this really should be market power that's determined by users all around the world. And we're only seeing data as a even more valuable commodity with the pandemic. As everyone is working from home, there's more and more data stored. Um, and today um, there are very few companies that own most of the data that everyone has. AWS has 30% market share <laughs> in most of the data. Um, out there. And so um, we're really trying to give everyone um, a choice. Uh, we don't, you know, force anyone on our platform, but we really do think that there should be a better option 
um, starting with decentralized file storage. And, you know, information at the cornerstone is the path to education, the path to access for so many people for economic mobility, um, to go into college, schools, jobs, everything you can imagine. And so we really want to blaze the frontier. I also want to emphasize we have um, a woman majority board and we have a woman majority executive team. Um, and, you know, we also have a team full of minorities and people from all around the world. And so we also believe in leadership by thinking about how we're structured organizationally. Everyone actually in our organization gets paid um, a U.S. salary no matter where they are in the world. Um, and, and, you know, we start with leading by example like that. So um, it's, it's part of our uh, mission in what we do daily, but we also try to do so in our org structure. Ira, any thoughts on financial inclusion and economic empowerment? Yeah, absolutely. And Clara, I love everything you're saying resonates so deeply with me. I absolutely agree that part of the barrier, one of the key barriers actually to financial inclusion for everyone is the monopolization. There's a couple of things, there's a couple of places, a couple of organizations that might just wield excess power over everyone um, who is working within their regime. Um, the way that we see creator economies is that right now, um, traditionally, creators have to rely on centralized platforms with gated walls. Um, and so now I'm talking just everyone from the fans that love their creators to the content creators themselves. There really is quite a monopoly. And the way that monetization works is that platforms take 100% and then dole out whatever financial pieces that they might want to for the creators themselves who are making the content. And so I know it's funny, we're talking about these big picture financial changes in the entire market. And I'm also focusing on something very grassroots, just down to the individuals who right now don't even understand crypto. What we want to do is really enable them to understand the technology and also really engage with the creators that they really love. Um, so what we're doing is we're reinventing the business model for creators. Um, centralized platforms, again, they take 100% of the revenue um, of everything that streams through. And what we're doing is thinking about, you know, for example, Patreon and Substack. They began to pave the way to replace ad-based monetization with direct to fan monetization. And we're taking that model to the next level by allowing the fans to participate and grow the economy alongside their favorite creators. And it, as things go, creators are able then to make an income. They can actually bring in a stream. Um, they can actually do what they really love, build up these communities, have people feel included. And the best part is we're not actually limited by who can join. So it can be a huge musician, it can be a small artist. Everyone has a place in this economy. And we really believe that empowering that is the way towards financial inclusion. Um, I'd like to pivot now and zero in a little bit on each of your um, expertise. Um, so Raj, you're a, a tax professional. Uh, why was there so much concern about cryptocurrency in the infrastructure bill? Um, we, we do have um, folks involved with Congress in the audience. Um, would love to get your thoughts on that. Going straight into it. All right, let's 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 do it. Um, I think, uh, you know, those of us who have been working on the regulatory end of, of, of crypto have been waiting for uh, directive and guidance, uh, whether it's from Treasury or IRS or even the government for quite some time. We know that the IRS had dropped a couple of notices on the last four years, um, one on the hard forks and airdrops and, and then an FAQ. Uh, but I think that there were a lot of areas and there continues to be a lot of um, areas that are, that are quite um, in the gray. So I think this particular uh, move uh, in Congress with the infrastructure bill was sort of the first big signal that there were um, concrete regulations on the way. Uh, the other thing is that you know, it, it did signal some some major changes. For example, the, the talk about an asset class change. For a long time, the CFTC um, and uh, the, the IRS and other uh, regulatory bodies have defined crypto in their own way. For example, the CFTC thought it's a commodity. The IRS has said it's property. Um, the SEC has had many different opinions on the type um, based on the type of assets. Uh, but we saw that in this uh, in this bill, we we heard the term security um, for the first time formally and starting 2023. So um, I think any, anyone who is involved in whether it's traditional finance or not, or, or, or crypto, would understand that it is a huge uh, thing to change asset class, which means that the reporting, the KYC information, everything you need from your customers, the internal systems that you need uh, to record that, how long you need to keep that information for audit purposes, all of that often changes based on the asset class. Um, and also, so 
the amount of information reporting that you have to do in terms of customers. Now, you know, we are all uh, probably familiar with a with a, if we had a broke traditional broker dealer um, account, we're familiar with a with a very um, exciting to tax nerds like me, but but awful to the rest of the world, a form called 1099B with lots of boxes, with lots of information. So the question is, is this now where crypto is going to be reported? Yet to be seen, we're waiting for the proposed regs from the treasury. The other thing that was very significant is the expansion of the term of broker dealer, right? So this is in the traditional finance world, um, it's a very specific definition of who a broker dealer is. There's usually an agent agency relationship, for example. When we look in the world of crypto, there are many actors that don't quite fit that uh, mold, but there was um, some concern that these actors would also be included in this definition of broker dealer. Um, and then there's expanded customer reporting that I just, just mentioned. And I think the final thing is that this is a new industry. This is an evolving industry. Uh, we're not talking about banks that have been around for 100 years, right? We're still grappling with a lot of things. The technology is fast. There's creative uh, ideation of products every day. Um, and, and I think that there is some concern that this could inhibit uh, that um, that innovation. Uh, now, personally, I, I don't believe so. I believe that, look, we either want to be a regulated industry or not. Um, I think the, uh, the material point should be to engage with the regulators, uh, to talk to Treasury, to talk to IRS as they start to create the, the foundations of these regulations and then uh, give us how to execute them and educate them to understand that certain things that work quite well in the traditional finance industry is not how the technology works here. So I do think that even though, you know, you often hear two very separate um, opinions coming out, um, one out of, you know, sort of the regulatory side of Washington, and then there's one out of some of the uh, actors in the crypto um, industry or the digital currency industry, there is a middle ground to be had, right? And I think, and, and I think the key to that is organic conversation, continued dialogue, and, and the word reasonable. Um, how do we balance the reasonableness of regulations so that it is both uh, regulatorily sound, but also is not inhibitive to innovation? Big challenge. Um, uh, Clara, you previously worked in Washington uh, as well at, at the intersection of public policy and technology. And um, as you described earlier, Filecoin Foundation is leveraging blockchain to store humanity's most important information. I love that phrase. Um, and um, creating a roadmap for Web 3.0. Can you go a little bit deeper as to sort of like what Web 3.0 is and why it's important? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm gonna just build on the points that I said earlier. Um, Web 1.0, um, we had the early architecture of the web. Um, and a good example is if you guys ever remember the days of MapQuest, where you had to reload the page every time you were on MapQuest, um, that was really Web 1.0. Web 2.0 is when, um, when you imagine Google Maps, now you can drag and drop. Um, there were a number of technologies left that allowed for a responsive web. And what really happened, the Web 2.0 explosion, was also the application marketplace of companies that wouldn't exist today without um, mobile phones. And, you know, Apple obviously um, led a lot of that movement with their app store. So, like, companies like Uber today would not exist without um, being able to use their cell phones. Web 3.0 is a new generation where we're really thinking about the web in a decentralized way, where there is no centralization of power and where... Um, everything starting with data storage as that foundation. Um, we have uh, companies that are building on top of our community from the WordPress for the web um, to the Dropbox for the web, right? Every single kind of company, we're seeing a lot of innovation happening today that I think most consumers won't see until probably a few years out, but also thinking about good and bad case scenarios. And I think what's really, really um, exciting and what policymakers uh, need to understand is there are so many amazing people that care about information access and decentralization of knowledge so that everyone can have fair and equal access to everything. Um, that is so different from, you know, everything um, negative that a lot of policymakers tend to hear in crypto. And I, I think DC and Washington and my time spent there, we tend to paint a very pessimistic view about the worst case scenario of what could happen. And that actually inhibits innovation because 
uh, innovation really comes to trial and error and um, really being able to experiment. And I have never, you know, I've worked across many industries in my career, but I've never seen some more more innovative than what is happening in blockchain and crypto today. I was at Mainnet this week and just the kinds of things that people are experimenting with, it's the fastest growing uh, space in terms of how quickly applications are launched. And I think that's something that, um, that's the other side that I think um, policymakers today have not quite understood is just uh, how how amazing it is for new ideas. Um, there's also a lot of people that really care about policy in a different hat. Um, I was in two discussions around decentralized um, uh, um, autonomous organizations, DAOs, and how that really uh, matters to governance in an online community. And, you know, there's a lot that both I think that community can learn from DC as well as vice versa the other way around. Um, but I will pause there and let others jump in. Yeah, so Ira, um, I'd love to hear from you because your world is um, really focused on the creative economy, as you started to touch on earlier. Um, can you talk about sort of the growth opportunities for creators and, and how blockchain and crypto is a part of that? Absolutely. And again, riffing off of the fellow panelists and Claire, what you're saying about how we're really at a sea change in terms of where technology has gotten. Um, we're embracing this very much. I mean, we've seen how content consumption, how content sharing and distribution has changed so much over time. Um, and now we're really at a point when, I mean, especially with the pandemic, all of us have been locked in our rooms for a long time. It turns out that the ability to connect with people on devices that don't require you to have a handshake or a hug, um, it still is a way for people to build their communities and to distribute content. Um, so I think the growth opportunities for creators are unlimited. Um, right now, we're seeing a lot of people just embrace digital as a new way to make content that they otherwise might not have done. Um, I mean, obviously, everyone knows how you can stream, you can have live chats, you can have all these different things, Zoom, here we are right now. Um, but also, there's this like digital art, like everyone has probably heard about the NFTs and, and how much is going on there. But it enables people that don't have access to, for example, brick and mortar, they maybe live in a smaller area or a place where they don't have a constant ability to go to a theater or to go to a museum um, or to have a concert stage. Um, there's a lot of folks that have just incredible talent and so much to offer. So I think we really embrace the fact that, again, um, focusing back on the point that this technology of blockchain enables something that previously could not be done. Not only does all of the innovation that's happened in technology and the platforms that people can actually show off their content and share with others and build communities, not only is that building up, and we don't even know what's up next, there's going to be so many more platforms to come, but also the power is in the economies. No longer are you tied to a single platform, no longer are you tied to one party who has all the centralized power. And I think this is a lot of what we're talking about here, just financial inclusion, removing the power structure from just one place and one centralized entity, and really enabling everyone to have access to it. I think that's key to what we're all talking about, frankly, to enable people to hold the power back. Um, and in crypto, I recognize as well, if you're not a crypto native, and if you haven't been living in this space for, for a long time, it's daunting. It's actually quite scary to, you know, try to get onto some of these decentralized exchanges and try to figure out what's going on. And I think that the sound bites are terrifying as well. What we often hear is just the news feeds of, you know, what's happening with crypto, the bad actors, but there's so much more. And what I'm looking forward to over the, you know, upcoming years is really more education, more, more communication, more people getting together like we're doing right now to really talk about where the technology really, like where the power of it really lies, which again is an ability to bring people together, to bring power back to individuals and to take some of the power away from the centralized structures that up until now has just been a given. And now we have the ability to change that. Well, we have a few minutes left before we pivot to our fireside chat uh, with Congressman Khanna. But um, so as we wrap up here, I would love to hear um, sort of each of your thoughts on how um, regulatory policy can impact innovation and any thoughts you have about, you know, how we might engage with policymakers going forward. But I'll, I'll start with you, Raj. Great. And I wanted to make, um, you know, a, a follow up comment to what, what Ira is saying is that, you know, I think there's a there's a fundamental difference when you think about how the, the world of digital currency works and, and how access works versus say traditional finance, right? If you look at a traditional financial firm, the competitive edge of those firms is 
is what they can hold on to themselves, right? That's the competitive edge. The fundamental difference is here, there's, there is a collaborative environment and a more sense of community in terms of how innovation is done. And I think that is one of, if I may borrow the phrase, another sea change, right? It's, it's a change in the way you think. And I think that regulations and how we think about regula regulating such industries also needs to be innovative to take into account some of the things that our, my fellow panelists have already said. It's definitely a change in the mindscape of how you think about progress, about access, about wealth and, and, uh, and access to data and everything for everyone else, right? So when we think about innovation, it's also innovation from areas where for century on, in this part of, of finance, it really hasn't changed that much. And I think that's what I wanna leave with is that we are here to, to engage with the regulators, with the policymakers, uh, but of what I, and, and have those dialogues. But what we also request of them is to come into these conversations with an open mind and a mindset that is different from how we would have done it in the last 50 to 70 years. Yeah, uh, Clara, any final thoughts on the intersection between innovation and regulation? Yeah, um, so a few years ago, um, a decade ago, I started a, a competition in Congress called Congressional App Challenge. And that was really to get members um, and young students all around the US to understand how applications work. And I really do think, um, you know, when it comes to understanding what's happening with Web3 and crypto, we need the same kind of um, healthy dialogue to really see uh, the good of it, right? Because there was a time and place where everyone thought the internet was just child pornography. And we forget that like, for example, distance learning wouldn't be possible today without um, without other, you know, other things moving forward. And so um, I definitely think that, you know, in order for us to really fully embrace innovation on all fronts, um, policymakers need to also sit at the table, come to some events, uh, judge at some hackathons, you know, really get into the weeds of what's happening here um, before policymaking even starts. And I encourage all of you guys to, um, you know, come out to our events. We we have a lot happening um, and, um, and just learn, just, you know, spend some time learning about how the technology works. Um, Ira, let's go to you for final thoughts on the intersection between policy and innovation. I, I agree again with everything my panelists have been saying. Um, all of us are projects that are working very hard to comply. You know, we, we I, I'm a lawyer, like this is what I do. I really want to ensure compliance and security and safety for everyone using products of any type, but mine and everyone else in the blockchain community. I think we're all invigorated to really support that. Um, what I think would be very helpful in terms of regulation and just the interaction as Raj is saying, um, we want to engage, we want to actually educate, we want people to understand this is not just all bad actors. There are always a few, but that should not define the industry. And I think the technology that we're looking into right now, blockchain and crypto, um, it's just so big that it's very easy, I think, to hear the sound bites and be afraid for constituents, you know, that someone might be harmed or that you might be enabling something that might, you know, end up in some criminal activity. Um, but I, I really want to focus on the fact that there's so much more than that. And that all of us projects that are really working hard to build in the financial compliance, to ensure the consumer protection, you know, we all have these goals in mind. Um, it's a challenging world right now, I think, for crypto, because there's no real clarity sometimes. And I know that this is a phrase that's used. It's not an accusation. It's simply a statement that sometimes we're ducking and weaving, and then we watch and we see that the enforcement has changed. Um, and so we're trying to make sure that we you know, go in the right lane, but then the lanes sometimes move. Um, so it makes it a little bit hard. It's, I'm not saying that we're not going to continue engaging and trying everything that we can, you know, to make sure we're in compliance with whatever the rules may be. But that clarity would be helpful. I think there's a lot of great ideas and great people that want to get involved, but they're a little bit daunted because it seems like a space that's just fraught with potential liabilities and, and dangers, even though we're trying to do the right thing. So I think there's just, just a huge amount of continued communication and just continued learning and working together to make sure that we can encourage these projects to innovate, um, but also that none of us are actually going to be doing the wrong thing accidentally. We are all actors that are trying to do the right thing here. Well, thank you so much, Ira and Clara and Raj. Um, this was a great discussion. Um, I think we learned a lot about 
how um, blockchain and crypto are not only important for financial inclusion, but for economic empowerment through the creator economy and, and the uh, Web 3.0, uh, as we learned as well. So thank you so much. Um, we are now going to pivot to our fireside chat with Congressman uh, Ro Khanna. Uh, Congressman Khanna is a member of the Congressional Asian Pacific America Caucus, um, as well as the Congressional Blockchain Caucus. He is working to ensure uh, our nation is focused on creating new tech jobs across the country, particularly for Americans left behind, um, and investing in science and technology uh, so the U.S. can win the uh, 21st century. Uh, prior to serving in Congress, Representative Khanna taught economics at Stanford University. He also served in President Barack Obama's administration as the Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, he's a true champion of blockchain in Congress, and so I'd like to welcome uh, Congressman Khanna. Um, why don't we dive right in with some questions here. Uh, so financial inclusion and digital um, equity are top priorities for you, it seems. Um, why are emerging technologies like blockchain and cryptocurrencies important to help create jobs of the future and promote economic empowerment? Well, thank you, uh, Kristen, for uh, hosting me and for uh, helping organize this, this conference. First, it, uh, blockchain can facilitate transactions, financial transactions for the most vulnerable. So you could consider, for example, undocumented immigrants who want to send money home uh, to their families. Right now, they may be unbanked. They may, uh, even if they are banked, have huge transaction fees that they have to undertake to be able to send money uh, to Central America or Mexico or wherever uh, else. Under blockchain, that fee wouldn't be there. So you could have uh, people actually sending money uh, to their families without a large transaction cost. And if it's properly deployed, blockchain actually can help deal with the situation of those who are uh, unbanked uh, by uh, not having the same uh, credit risk that banks uh, have, and, and that's why they uh, don't provide services to folks, and also by not having the same fees. Uh, so uh, again, a, a, a technology that could be deployed to help uh, those who are the most vulnerable economically uh, in our uh, in our country, and then of course uh, these uh, you've seen so much uh, success of uh, blockchain currencies and the exchanges, and those are all creating jobs, uh, and we need them to be regulated. Obviously, any cryptocurrency transaction should be taxed, uh, just like anything else, and there should be disclosure requirements on the exchanges, uh, just like anything else. Uh, but these are creating jobs, and we want these jobs. Uh, in this wealth generation to be in the United States, not outside the United States. Yeah, no, I think um, we agree. We like to, um, you know, remind folks that it's it's not a wild west. There is regulation in place today on a lot of these, uh, you know, different participants within the ecosystem. I think the problem is, as the panel was discussing earlier, is it is a little bit of a square peg and a round hole. And so having a fresh look and how to do it more effectively um, to reach the end goals in a way that makes sense for the new technology, I, I, I think is very important. Um, so I would um, like to pivot to a slightly different topic. Um, so the House is in session. Um, and there is a vote on the infrastructure bill, I, I think, coming. Um, and, uh, you know, back in um, August, you joined representatives uh, Eshu, uh, Soto, um, and others on a speaker uh, or on a letter to Speaker Pelosi, um, urging them to address a cryptocurrency tax provision, um, which expands the definition of broker to include things like miners and stakers, software and hardware developers. Um, and then you said at the time on Twitter that while you support um, smart regulations, the language as it stands picks winners and losers. Um, can you give us a sense of where things stand um, on this provision and also maybe more broadly on the infrastructure bill because I, that does seem to be- yeah. Well, first we gotta get the infrastructure bill through. Right now that's the focus. Uh, how do we come to an agreement on the caucus between both the Build Back Better uh, bill, which is gonna uh, have climate provisions and uh, have childcare and the infrastructure bill. And a lot of the focus is there, but Darren Soto and I are leading a letter to make sure that when we do do, do that, uh, we fix some of the mistakes in the Senate bill. Everyone is for know your customer if it comes to the uh, currency exchanges, if it comes to uh, the, the actual exchanges that are facilitating transactions. But it makes no sense to have some miner who's simply solving computational issues 
uh, be subject to uh, disclosure requirements of knowing customers when they don't have customers. And it makes no sense for a software developer to do that when they're not actually engaged in, uh, in, in commercial exchange. It wouldn't be like having a know your uh, customer requirement on someone who is designing the software for Bank of America. I mean, it make, makes little sense. So what we want to do is have the regulation appropriately crafted. I think Senator Wyden had uh, appropriate language on that, and uh, and he's for regulation. He doesn't want this to be the unregulated Wild West. He thinks tri cryptocurrency transactions need to pay tax like everyone else. Uh, he wants to make sure that there isn't use of these currencies for criminal or ransom, uh, ransom. but it shouldn't uh, be overly uh, onerous on people who have nothing to do with transactions. And, and that is the clarification that we need and that the Blockchain Caucus is pursuing. Yeah, no, I think I think the Blockchain Caucus has been an absolutely wonderful forum for members of Congress who, like yourself, who are interested in this space to come together and and because uh, really there's so much I think as we've discovered today there's so many different topics to learn about and having uh, you know sort of that that foundation is important so very much appreciate your work uh, your work with the with the Blockchain Caucus. Um, uh, we'll go to the next question, and then I think we'll pivot to um, some Q and A. So, for those of you who have questions for the congressman, please feel free to put them in the chat, um, and we will uh, be sure to get to those. Um, but one question I had is, um, you know, entrepreneurs and small businesses, you know, as always, continue to be the engine of America's economy, and U.S. regulatory policy. Uh, you know, will determine if they can innovate, build, scale, and thrive, particularly, you know, when the blockchain and crypto space here at home. Um, and you spoke a little bit about sort of your vision for what, you know, regulatory um, framework we might need, but what role do you think um, the blockchain and cryptocurrency industry and even its broader ecosystem should play in advancing the legislative framework um, to enhance uh, you know, the policies so that we can continue to stay competitive here at home? Well, I certainly think their perspective has to be considered as one of the, the stakeholders and they ought to be letting uh, people know the implications of, of, of regulation. They ought to help us come up with good regulations because uh, they will know the abuses in the industry. They will know where taxes are being avoided uh, so they can help us come up with regulations that actually uh, will be effective. Uh, and that won't uh, be overbroad. And so uh, the, the final word will be with the uh, regulatory agencies and, and, and lawmakers, because you can't have an industry self-regulate, uh, but uh, it makes no sense to uh, regulate an industry without considering the industry's input, just like if you were to regulate Wall Street or pharmaceuticals or, 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 or tech companies, you would at least see what their perspective was. You may disregard it, you may disagree with it, uh, but they should be involved in uh, in, in helping us uh, uh, craft regulation that will be effective. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the, the things that we often speak with on the, on the industry side of things is what is sort of the ideal pathway uh, to get sound comprehensive policy. Uh, do you think that, that as we look to improving the way that, that the crypto industry is regulated, do you think that Congress has a role to play or do you think that this is something that the agencies are better equipped to do or is it a little bit of a little bit of both? It's a little bit of both and Congress is playing a role in the infrastructure bill. So if we are gonna step into the debate then we need to do so well and we need to make sure that our definitions are uh, appropriate and have considered all the ramifications. But then ultimately it'll be the agencies interpreting it and setting the rules that I think will uh, make the biggest difference. And part of what we need is just clarity. I mean, right now, there's so much ambiguity. What type of cryptocurrency is an asset? What is not an asset? What is transactional? This is uh, something that we ought to just have clarity on. I mean, you can define it in uh, different ways, but I think what people want is just a, a, a clear uh, regulatory framework that they can count on. So how um, how did you first become interested in this space? Like, what what attracted you to learning about this? I mean, this is uh, you know in the industry we often talk about going down the rabbit hole for the first time, and um, uh, and uh, you know people who are doing this on the day to day become very passionate about it. Uh, what 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 sort of um, first made you look at the world of blockchain and cryptocurrency, and and how did you go about learning about these these issues? Well, I represent Silicon Valley, so every uh, uh, 
uh, technologist there was talking about it. And there's so many startup entrepreneurs I met and people who are very bullish on, uh, on, on this technology as having the ability to solve problems, not just when it comes to, to currency, but the ability to uh, solve problems of, of data transfer, of data share, sharing in ways that are, uh, have a record uh, in, in optimizing storage. So I, I started talking to, to different technologists about it and then entrepreneurs. And, uh, and that's, uh, there's a robust ecosystem uh, where I live. Um, I have a question here from uh, Julian, who I happen to know in the audience, uh, asking um, if you can, um, Congressman, share a little bit more insight into the dynamics of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus. Um, you know, sort of where does it lean? You know, how pro crypto are members? Um, and do you have any counterparts in the Senate that are doing similar work? Well, it's a bipartisan caucus. It's got uh, Representative Emmers, uh, myself, Darren Soto, as, as sort of visible active members. And then I, I, I don't know exactly how many are uh, participants, but those, the three of us tend to be quite, uh, quite engaged. Uh, and, you know, I think the perspective is, is, is neither pro or con, just like I, I, I think technology, I mean, everyone's for technology. It's quite, question is, how do you shape it? And so I think it's uh, for smart regulation is how I would des describe the caucuses is bet that we want to see uh, cryptocurrency regulated, but we want to see, make sure that it's regulated uh, effectively with a knowledge of technology. And I don't know if the Senate, you would know is that if the Senate has one or not. I, I, I don't know that. Uh, well, I know there's not a Congressional Blockchain Caucus. There is a Financial Innovation Caucus that focuses, you know, sort of specifically, you know, on the financial piece of it. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, I think I think the House has been uh, much further ahead in trying to figure out this technology and the issues associated with it. And um, yeah, very much appreciate your uh, your involvement there. Um, uh, a question I had is, I know um, I know you spoke at uh, a conference of in New York last week, the SALT conference. Um, I, I was there as well. And I, I was sort of struck by, uh, you know, as somebody who often travels to um, crypto conferences, th this one was a little bit different for me because this was, uh, you know, a bunch of people in suits, you know, normally the crypto yeah. crowd is uh, hanging out in their t-shirts and, um, and much more casual. And, and it was the first time where I really felt like Wow, this has gone beyond um, sort of the Silicon Valley types, um, you know, the the programmer types, and is really starting to um, hit more um, traditional investors. Um, do you um, can you share a little bit about um, what you spoke about at that conference, and um, also what um, you know any sort of takeaways you had, um, you know, from the fact that so many of the the discussions at that conference were around blockchain and cryptocurrency? Well, it was a terrific conference. I enjoyed being on the panel with Jeb Bush. It was nice to, to have a rational conversation with someone on the other side of the aisle, even where you disagreed, uh, and someone who didn't just bash immigrants reflexively. Uh, so uh, I, I think the question was, how do we come together on issues of American competitiveness? And uh, we both agreed that immigration strengthens America and makes us more innovative. We both agreed we need fundamental investments in uh, infrastructure. We both agree that we need to have some kind of policy to bring critical supply chains back. I have a stronger view of industrial policy and uh, uh, Governor Bush probably wanted more tax cuts, tax incentives, but uh, that, that is the kind of conversation that we need to be having in this country uh, about how we strengthen our competitiveness, our innovation uh, to lead the 21st century. So it was quite refreshing and uh, a much more reasonable conversation that often had than what often takes place in the halls of Congress. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I think that's all of the audience questions um, that we have so far. I, maybe I'll shoot it over to my fellow panelists from earlier. Any final thoughts for the Congressman before we sign out? No? All right. Um, well, thank you, Chris. Thank you for your leadership on these issues. Uh, your, uh, really uh, a, a source of uh, a, a large uh, expertise on many of these issues and I appreciate what you do. Yeah, no, thank you, Congressman Kana. We really appreciate it. Um, I, I also wanna thank Congressman Christian Murthy who recorded some remarks for us earlier, um, as well as our speakers, uh, Ira Lamb, 
Clara Sow and Raj Mukherjee. Very excited, Raj is moving to DC in a couple of weeks, so we'll have his expertise uh, available to us at a moment's notice. But a wonderful conversation. Um, I hope that, that our virtual audience today learned a lot. Um, you know, I'd also like to thank um, Madeline Milka, who um, actually couldn't make it this morning due to an emergency, um, uh, and also Deanne Herman, um, and the entire APAX team for collaborating with us at the Blockchain Association uh, to convene this briefing. Um, and thank you all for joining us, and I really hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>